All right, good evening, everyone. Welcome, students, staff, faculty, community members, and everyone else to Elon's campus for Community Connections. My name is Mel Whitman, and I am a senior and a Periclean scholar here at Elon University focused in Central Appalachia. Tonight, we hope to engage in an ongoing discussion on the topic of poverty, which was, which was highlighted by Lyndon B. Johnson 50 years ago this month. As a Periclean scholar in Central Appalachia myself, I've worked closely with a lot of people in this situation and can tell that it is apparent um, that poverty merits a, uh, merits a constructive and immediate conversation. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce Ken Gaither, Associate Dean and Professor in Elon School of Communications, published author and distinguished public relations professional to lead us in this important discussion. Ken. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Melanie. So I am a couple hours from being back from Turkey, Istanbul. And uh, so I'm a little, a little fuzzy, but I think I can make it through this evening. Uh, it is such an honor to be here, and it's a pleasure to follow up on the second Community Connections program uh, following up on last semester's program on healthcare reform. And as Melanie mentioned, 50 years ago this month, President Lyndon B. Johnson used his State of the Union address to declare a war on poverty. And that led, of course, to the creation of Medicare and Medicaid, Head Start, the Job Corps, and permanent food stamp programs, among many other initiatives. So tonight, we consider whether that war has been won or lost, or perhaps where that war has led us. Indeed, this is a war that is persistent, pervasive, and systemic. It is against an enemy that is both hidden and public. It is an issue that is far too complex to merely frame as a human rights or social justice issue. Its dimensions range from the role of the government to economics, among many others. It is the centerpiece of the United Nations Millennium Development Goals. It is an issue that resists simple causality and categorizations. And if we continue with LBJ's war metaphor, this war has far too many casualties. According to economist Jeffrey Sachs, more than 8 million people around the world die each year because they are literally too poor to stay alive. To put that in scale, consider the population of North Carolina, which is 9.8 million. This is a battle fought in our community, across our state and nation, and indeed across the world. Some of the people who are on the front lines of that battle, both professionally, spiritually, and intellectually, join us this evening as invited and community panelists. So before I get too far ahead, uh, let me tell you about Poll Everywhere. And what you're gonna see throughout the evening are questions and prompts that are posed right here. And we invite you to participate with your mobile devices. And as you participate, we will, uh, in real time, be able to see your questions and review your questions. And those questions will be later on posted online so everybody can see all the questions. And if you don't have a mobile device, we don't assume you do, uh, you have a card that should have been placed on your seat. And that is for you to write questions. And please continue to ask questions and to participate throughout the event this evening. We hope this is, there's robust discussion. So whether you're participating via social media or with that card, there are going to be people coming down the aisles. Uh, please write your, your question and give it to one of those people, and then it will be typed up, and it will be posted again online, and we will have real-time access so we can see your questions to generate our discussion for the evening. So before going too much further, let me thank the Community Connections Planning Committee. A lot of people have worked really hard to put this all together. And 
thank you to our partners at the Burlington Times News for its commitment to our community and for serving as a beacon of civic journalism. The antidote to the excesses of the digital age is conversation. This program is about that conversation, one where our panelists and community convene on the crucial issue of poverty. Ours is, is, is intended as a forum for thoughtful discussion and dialogue, talking face to face in real time without the veil of anonymity of a chat room or a wiki. So we encourage you to keep the conversation going, to keep it robust this evening. Uh, again, please participate via poll everywhere and with your question cards. And please recognize that immediately following tonight's forum, we will have light refreshments and snacks right next door at 815. Please join us so we can keep that conversation going. Quickly, some ground rules. For our discussion, civility is appreciated and dissent is expected. Respectfulness is required. Time will be of the essence. Uh, each of our community panelists will have three minutes and our invited panelists will have five minutes to make their uh, opening discussion points. And when we move to the question phase, we will take your questions from both Poll Everywhere and the note cards and we will try to keep the conversation going uh, as best we can. So let us begin with our community panelists, and I'm gonna ask each of the panelists in turn to please come up, introduce themselves, and then they will have three minutes, and as they are talking, please participate with those cards and your mobile devices. So let's begin with Phil Bowers, please. Thanks, Ken. Uh, my name is Phil Bowers. I'm the executive director and founder of a group called Sustainable Alamance, uh, primarily dealing with men and women with criminal records. Give a man a fish, you feed him for a day. Teach him how to fish, you feed him for life. This old proverb misses one major point, and it's only true if the man has access to the lake. <laughs> Today, hundreds if not thousands of men and women in Alamance County don't have access to the resources they need to lift themselves out of poverty, such as jobs and supportive services. And these are all men and women with criminal records. Tommy was raised in Alamance County. He experienced 30 years of drugs and alcohol abuse and had the criminal record to go with it. Decisions that prevented him from using his skills as a master carpenter. Tommy owed $22,000 in back child support with virtually no hope of getting it paid back and he had no relationship with his two daughters. After coming into our program, Tommy had somebody to walk with him through all this mess. We were able to find him a job, a job that he leveraged into an even better job. And now he is the um, head maintenance man for one of the largest property owners in Alamance County. But he will tell you that that's not the best part. Where there was no relationship with his daughters, he has since walked his oldest daughter down the aisle at her wedding, and he has daily conversations with his youngest daughter. Uh, he has a good job, but he also has a place in the lives of his kids, of a father and an advisor. And four months ago, he finished paying off $22,000 in back child support. But he did these things. He just needed support, relational support, as well as access to the local economy. So poverty is much bigger than a job. It's a lack of hope, hope that I might make it out, hope that I might find a job that would allow me to have child care, and hope that I'm not forced to make a choice between food and education, but somehow I might have both. Moving out of poverty requires a head and a heart change. To make an impact on poverty, we must build relationships with the poor so they will see that we value them as human beings. We must change our view of poverty as people in neighborhoods with deficiencies that need to be served, but to change that to underutilized resources that need to be mined and developed. Not just providing services to and for, but doing life with the poor. When we do to and for the poor, we're sending a message that somehow they don't have anything of value that we want in return. 
and we're trying to make it less painful simply for them to cope in poverty. When we do life with the poor, we see that they have talents and dreams and that we might merge our resources so that we can walk together out of poverty. I dropped that really low, huh? Um, before I get started, I think that um, my name is Kim Crawford. I'm the executive director of Allied Churches, which is the shelter here in uh, Alamance County. And before I get started, I, I think that it's really important that you all understand that I am here for the 70 people that spent the night at the shelter last night. That includes Deanne, Hadiza, Jimmy, Bobby, Ann, and Richard. So. As you hear my words, please understand that these are not just coming from me, but again, from the average of 70 to 85 people that spend the night in our shelter. It's difficult to imagine the cold and the wet, the isolation and alienation. Homelessness seems so distant to many of us. We ask ourselves, how can this happen? And yet it can and it does. For diverse and sometimes complex reasons, it happens to ordinary people. And sadly, over time, the street disconnects them from the rest of us. Homelessness, poverty, too often and too easily destroys the human spirit. Nearly 46 million people in the United States live at or below the poverty level today. More than 16 million children under the age of 18 are living in poverty. And here locally at Allied Churches, last year we served over 655 different people. 22% were kids. Additionally, we serve approximately 630 families each month in our food pantry and provide over 10,000 meals each month in our soup kitchen. Mary has been coming to Allied Churches on and off for the past several months. This past week, she received some fresh milk and cereal because she didn't have enough money to feed her little girls. It's a blessing because it's good food. The people are nice and give you what you need, and they have things that the kids like, says Mary. My husband works, but at the end of the month, we just run out of money. I don't know what I would do without allied churches. This story, our stories, are more than stories about poverty. They are stories about relationships and communities. It makes us people who are related in the very essence of our being, people who have to live in community, in relationship to one another. We need to respect the primary demand to have food and to have medical care the demand to be clothed, the demand to be sheltered, not only against the weather, but also to find a place where we can learn what it means to live in an ever broader and larger community. We value family and community because we realize, protect, and sustain our dignity and our rights precisely in relationship with others. And where houses are placed has a direct effect on wealth, education, employment, health, transportation, and safety. The concern that brings us together around poverty reaches out to many more basic concerns. When we advocate for affordable housing, for example, we are really advocating for people, for families, for community, and for opportunity. And when we develop affordable housing, we are really developing people and families, communities, and opportunity. Mary's story of allied churches illustrates that vital role that charities play. Mary's family needs food today, not a debate about economics. People who care about hunger and housing must respond directly by helping a family in need, volunteering at a community agency, or supporting private agencies that assist poor people. But effective help for people living in poverty walks on two legs, the leg of charity and the leg of public policy. People of goodwill must respond to the immediate needs with immediate help, but the fight against poverty won't move forward if we, also, if we don't also use the other leg and advocate for better governmental policy. I'm reminded of the words of Martin Luther King. True compassion is more than flinging a coin to a beggar. It comes to see that an edifice which pr produces beggars needs restructuring. Thanks. Good evening. 
I'm Scott Morrison. I'm an assistant professor in the School of Education here at Elon, and I am proud to say that. Um, I am also a foster parent, and that is the capacity in which I am speaking this evening. So the title for my remarks is called Fostering as Activism in the War on Poverty. In the United States, there are approximately 400,000 children in foster care, and they spend on average two years in the system. North Carolina has seen a decrease in the number of children in foster care over the past five years, but there were still almost 14,000 in 2010. Through no fault of their own, children in foster care are victims of abuse, neglect, and severe trauma, almost always at the hands of those charged with caring for them. Children in foster care often come from impoverished homes. This means they tend to be exposed to food with lower nutritional value, struggle academically, lack hope and optimism, and suffer insecurities and distress. In short, poor children suffer a disproportionate share of deprivation, hardship, and bad outcomes. So imagine with me for a minute what life is like for a typical child entering foster care. They were born into poverty or very close to it. Their parents might be some combination of absent, addicted, abusive, illiterate, and distressed. They may have experienced multiple traumatic events, which will likely affect their ability to trust others, their sense of personal safety, and their ability to manage emotions. Half of them, statistically speaking, will not finish high school. And of those that do graduate, only six will receive a college diploma. This is not the kind of life we would wish for anyone. So what do we do? In yesterday's Washington Post, Kevin Wellner wondered if President Obama, in his State of the Union speech tomorrow evening, would recommend appropriate treatments to alleviate the repercussions of wealth inequality in the US. Like Wellner, I hope that President Obama has the wisdom and spends the political capital necessary to advocate for policies that will ameliorate the causes and effects of poverty. That is, in my opinion, part of his job. My job, however, is different. I have to look around me and decide what role I can play in the reduction of poverty, what I can do to improve the lives of others that are caught in cycles of neglect and abuse. My wife and I decided four years ago to open our home to children in need of care. We have the arms to hold them, the lips to kiss them, the food to feed them, the beds in which they can rest peacefully, and the strength to defend them from harm. We do not have magic powers to heal them, but what we do have, we give freely and in abundance. I recognize that obliterating poverty is complex and will require action on numerous fronts over a long period of time, but I firmly believe that part of the work can be accomplished by fostering children who are the innocent victims. Good evening. I'm Heidi Norwick, and I am the Vice President and Director of Community Impact for the United Way of Alamance County. The United Way is an organization of donors and volunteers that identifies human service needs, educates and involves the community, and acquires and allocates funds to address these needs in a manner that ensures accountability and the maximum effectiveness. United Way is one of the primary partners in the Alamance County Community Needs Assessment. We collect local data, state data, on human service needs and set priorities on our funding based on these findings. Currently, we fund programs and services that include medication assistance and health care for indigent and uninsured individuals, assistance for seniors applying for Medicare Part D, financial counseling, foreclosure prevention, adult day programs for the elderly and disabled so their caregivers can stay and go to work, shelters for the homeless, domestic violence victims, those with mental illness, substance abuse, or alcohol dependencies, financial assistance for after school and summer programs for working parents, self-sufficiency programs, 
legal assistance to prevent evictions, obtain expungements and benefits, assistance for persons with felony convictions, disaster relief for families displaced by fire, and emergency financial assistance. Without these safety nets, more families would be experiencing poverty than currently are today. The poverty rate in 2012 in Alamance County was 19.5%. 29.2% of our children live in poverty in Alamance County. The median family income, $41,394 for a family of four. In addition to providing funding, we have several direct services serving the poor through United Way. We administer the voluntary um, volunteer tax preparation program for low-income people, disabled veterans, and the elderly, known as VITA. We manage the federal emergency food and shelter program, Duke Energy funds that come to our community for heating, cooling, and electric for low-income customers, nc211.org and 211, a database of programs and services managed for Alamance County resources. We have produced the Community Guide to Assistance, a comprehensive listing of critical needs that may be found on our website, and 10,000 printed copies have been given out to our community in the past year. For the first time in Alamance County, we will participate in Project Homeless Connect this Thursday at Hope Church in Burlington. Every January, an annual point in time count is taken across the nation and here in Alamance County to determine the homeless in our community. As you can imagine, this is a difficult task and we know we are underreporting that number of homeless. We're not getting the actual number. Project Homeless Connect will provide access to critical services for the homeless popul population, give them information and resources, and a lunchtime meal so that they can connect with services in our community and we can hope to get a more accurate count so that more resources will come to our community for the homeless population. When the community is in crisis and needs solutions, they look to United Way for the answers. United Way is a leader in data analysis, support for needed services, initiating new solutions, collaborations among nonprofits, and evaluating needs and progress. If you want to affect change for the poor in our community, I encourage you to contact me at United Way. Thank you. Hello everyone, I am Maureen Richmond. I am a resident of Burlington in Alamance County. I'm delighted to be here. This evening I'm representing Iva Kaufman and Associates of New York City. Our principal is here, Iva Kaufman, representing the American Sustainable Business Council. We all know that if we do not have a robust economy locally, nationally, and internationally, uh, what the consequences are going to be. Uh, I firmly believe that as long as there are people on this planet, we have the basis for an economy. We just have to put our minds to it and stop believing that there are no solutions. So Iva Kaufman and Associates does uh, promote certain innovative solutions for all of the things that we've been talking about. And I would like to also say that I feel uh, deeply with all the sentiments that have been articulated by the uh, presenters before me. With all that in mind, Iva Kaufman and Associates provides clients with a strategic and venturesome approach to nonprofit management, philanthropy, and corporate social responsibility. And this is our contribution to the discussion tonight. The causes of impoverish impoverishment in our community and throughout the world are many. Among them count heavily the nature of the surrounding environment and that of the local economy. Where the land has suffered stress and no longer produces crops and materials, and where the local economy provides few safe and remunerative employment options, profound impoverishment results. At Iva Kaufman and Associates, we seek out and support innovative programs to address both environmental and economic distress, intimately related factors which feed back upon each other. Through a combination of services, we facilitate the creation of solutions to these twin concerns in some of the world's hardest 
hit locations, experiencing scarcity and all its ramifications. For example, in Mexico and Guatemala, we support a project which alleviates poverty by reaching out to economically disadvantaged women with the small loan financing they need to set up their own businesses. Administered by the Namaste Foundation, a micro-lending nonprofit based in San Francisco, the project is called Namaste Direct and has successfully assisted many rural Mexican and Guatemalan women with not only the financial means to engage in enterprise, but also with ongoing small business advice. A second project reaching directly into the areas most affected by deep poverty centers around the planting of hardy and productive trees in areas of the world deeply impacted by environmental degradation, which results from a host of factors, as we know. Fiscally sponsored by the California nonprofit Earthways Foundation, this tree planting project aims to help reverse the serious worldwide trend toward deforestation and is appropriately named Green World. Green World operates in Kenya presently with plans to expand into many other countries similarly affected. And in Kenya, it not only improves the environment through restoring tree cover and working to both replenish and conserve soil, but also provides rural communities with edible and marketable crops. These two projects, we think, stand as models of initiatives which could be undertaken anywhere, even right here in Alamance County. Iva Kaufman and Associates hopes these ideas and others like them will grow and enrich the lives of all, and we continue to work toward that end. So give me just a second. Imagine that everybody in this room represents a needy family in North Carolina. If that's the case, then that means everybody from about here to here has to make the decision between paying for food and paying their heat bills. 42% of this room would have that decision to make. That's a large amount of people, and that's a very hard decision. Hi. My name is Jensen Roll, and I am a sophomore here at Elon University studying social entrepreneurship. Today I would like to talk to you about getting rid of that statistic. And I would like to mention that through, so, or I would like to say that it is through social entrepreneurship that we can do this. What, what we're looking at here is hunger. So what I'd like to talk about today is an idea to get rid of hunger in the social entrepreneurial aspect. The idea is called HOPE, Helping Other People Eat, which is a new social enterprise here in Alamance County. HOPE seeks to provide sustainable financial support for food kitchens like allied churches. We identify two problems here in Alamance County. First, which is the need for financial support to um, nonprofit organizations. The second, is hunger awareness, so building that up. Hope believes that if people truly understand the need for the poor and the hungry, that they will be more willing to get involved with the fight against hunger and other issues of poverty. In this struggle, we have come up with a certification process. So when you go to a Hope certified restaurant, you will have a bill that comes back to you, and at the bottom of the bill, it will have a question. Would you like to donate a dollar to helping other people eat? You can check yes or no to this question. Through this one dollar, you have five pounds of food that will go towards helping places like Allied Churches, who we heard from earlier in this discussion. Five pounds of food goes a long way for a family that hasn't eaten for a week. Five pounds of food, as you can see, is a lot. Um, and as I hope you're beginning to see, Hope focuses on bringing people together around this cause. It builds a community. Instead of focusing on only a few people who support allied churches, a few 
um, large donors, you have a large base of people coming together that have small donations, all putting this um, financial support together. The entire community is starting to understand that there are people here in Almance County who don't get to, as we heard, eat every week. 19.5% are living below the poverty line. So as we move forward, it is ideas like hope that we need to start to realize can change our community. It is social entrepreneurship that can change the way that we think about business. <clears throat> to do this, we have to come together, and we have to be strong, and we have to work with one another to see that not only is it our community members, but it's the world that we're all a part of. Moving this not only from Allied, or Alamance County, but into neighboring communities. This is social entrepreneurship, and this is how Alamance County can grow stronger as one. Thank you. That concludes the comments from our community panelists, and please join me one more time in giving them a round of applause for their contributions. And if you're not participating, please do so with your mobile devices. Uh, you can participate in Poll Everywhere in the prompts here and those cards that are on your chairs, please write down your thoughts and your questions. Those will become part of the record, which will be uh, available to those of us up here in real time and posted on the website. So please get involved, get plugged in, fill out those cards, and people will be walking down the aisles to collect those cards. We now turn to our invited panelists, beginning with Nikki Ratliff. Good evening, everyone. I work with public housing families. Many of you probably have seen things on TV like they're welfare queens. But what really matters to these families are the same things that matter to many of you in the audience. The faces of poverty that I work with look like me. They look like you. The faces in public housing want the best lives for their children. They want a meaningful career. They want success defined by them, not success defined by the majority. People in poverty are faced with decisions that most don't have to make every day. Questions like, should I take this part-time job, even though the salary will cost, won't cover what it costs for me to even come, go to work? Having to pay childcare, having to pay gas, or someone to take them to work when they're only making $7.25 an hour and probably only make, working 20 hours a week. To them, they have to make the decision. Do I take this job or do I stay home where I know my budget won't fluctuate. They also have to answer questions like, should I buy these prescriptions or should I pay my utility bill? Utility bills are directly related to housing and public housing, so if they don't pay their utilities, they could lose their housing. Prescriptions, utility bills. These are not questions or decisions that we have to make on a regular basis. Those living in poverty want success defined by them, self-sufficiency defined by them. They want to be able to live out their own dreams that's created by them. Fair access and the removal of barriers to the basics are what those in poverty need most. Common misperceptions, misconceptions of those in poverty are that they're lazy, they don't want to work, that they're substance abusers, not engaged in the community that they don't care about their children. Many that I've come in contact with in public housing want to leave public housing as quickly as they receive the keys to enter public housing. At Burlington Housing Authority, we provide an opportunity for residents to become equipped with skills so that they can transition from public housing into their own self-defined self-sufficiency. Many come to public housing simply as a shelter they're escaping situations that are unsafe for them and their children. They are escaping situations where they've had to make choices of life or death. 
Many of you heard about welfare queens. How many welfare queens do you know want 65 or 100 other neighbors living so closely to them? People in public housing do work. 166 of our tenants work. They earn wages. 131 of our tenants are receiving some sort of disability or social security. Only 32 of our tenants are receiving TANF. 40 receive child support and two receive unemployment. The faces of poverty are faces like yours. Good evening. I'm Toddy Peters, and I'm professor of religious studies here at Elon University. And I'm also the director of a new poverty and social justice minor that just began um, this year. A recent survey found that 31% of millionaires um, do not consider themselves wealthy. In fact, it wasn't until they reached the 5 million mark that the majority of respondents began to indicate that they considered themselves wealthy. While this might be an example of the problem of relative poverty or determining what we need in order to achieve social inclusion, most discussions of relative poverty focus more on how important access to things like cell phones or televisions or cable might be for social inclusion. But most discussions of poverty focus on absolute poverty, on those most basic needs we have in order to survive, food, clothing, shelter. In the United States, the federal poverty guidelines are focused on this measure of absolute poverty. They were developed by a woman named Molly Orshansky and adopted by the federal government in 1965 as a working definition of poverty. Since food costs represented a third of family expenditures at the time, Orshansky used the USDA's economy food plan, which estimated the lowest cost at which people could provide all the necessary food for their family. So Orshansky took this number and multiplied it by three, and that gave her an approximate poverty guideline. 50 years later, we still use Orshansky's model to determine the federal poverty guidelines, despite the fact that falling food prices and rising housing, health care, and transportation costs mean the average family now uses only about a sixth of their income for food today. So this helps explain why many economists and public policy discussions focus on that figure of 200% of the poverty level as a more adequate representation of the number of people living in or near poverty in the US. But regardless of how we define poverty in economic terms, most of us would agree with the more colloquial definition of poverty that Orshansky used when describing her own childhood. As she put it, her family could barely make ends meet. In our country today, too many people can barely make ends meet. We seem to be in the midst of a perfect storm of insufficient housing, wages, schools, transportation, childcare, healthcare, and healthy food, so that it is becoming increasingly unlikely that people on the economic margins can follow Orshansky out of poverty and into the American dream. You see, Molly was the daughter of Ukrainian immigrants and was the first in her family to graduate from high school or college. And she went on to become a food economist and a social science researcher. 80% of Americans believe it is possible to pull yourself up by your bootstraps. While social mobility is certainly possible in the United States, studies are showing that it's not likely. One recent study showed that a son whose father made 16,000 a year, which put him in the lowest 10% of wage earners, had only a 5% chance of earning over 55,000, which is right in the middle um, of the, the uh, uh, in income quintiles. 
The U.S. Census Bureau has estimated that 32.2% of residents in Alamance County are low income or below twice the federal poverty level. That's just under 50,000 people. While the mythology of the American dream ostensibly gives hope to poor and working class people that it is possible for those who are talented and hardworking to climb out of poverty, in a world where it is nearly impossible for a third of the population to pay all of their bills, even in families where one adult is working full time, rags to riches stories can function as a cultural narrative to blame the poor for not working hard enough. The fact that the poor and near poor in our country not only can't pay their bills, but have increasingly lost the capacity to move out of poverty is a moral crisis. Alamance County, North Carolina, and the United States ought to have as our primary domestic economic objective the goal of ensuring that people have access to achieving some measure of the good life. We need secure jobs that pay living wages and offer vacation, sick leave, and pensions. We need safe, affordable housing and quality public schools for all of our children, not just those who live in affluent zip codes. For the health of our environment, as well as for addressing poverty, we need better public transportation and better access to healthy food. And for the overall well-being of our communities and our children, we need high-quality, affordable childcare. Poverty is a moral problem, but it is not the morality of the people who are poor that is at issue. It is the morality of a system in which it is unlikely you can stop being poor that is the moral shame of our nation. Good evening. My name is John Hood from the John Locke Foundation in Raleigh. I thank you very much for the invitation to be here today and already to be inspired by so many of the fascinating and compelling stories of individuals who are involved in direct service to those who are low income or impoverished. Uh, other than as a donor or volunteer, I do not have experience. My wife runs a direct service nonprofit, but I never have. So I'm going to leave the managerial uh, knowledge about that to people who know better than I do and talk about uh, the other leg. There was a leg of charity and a leg of public policy that was mentioned earlier, I think by Ms. Crawford. So I'm going to talk a little bit about public policy. It's what I do for a living is argue. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, there's a difference between arguing and bickering. Uh, to construct an argument is to engage in a civilized activity that's necessary for us to figure out what we want to do in our communities, in our state, in our nation. Whereas to bicker is just to pick faults with the other person or engage in various kinds of character assassination or uh, ad hominem attacks. Now, we all know from rhetoric that a, an argument has three pieces to it. This is really important when it comes to debating poverty, as we were just talking, as the previous speaker just got to. We assume that argument involves people disagreeing about the conclusions of something, and we ignore the fact that you have to have two first things. You have to define your terms in a way that everybody agrees with before you can have a meaningful argument, and you have to, you have, to have some common premises, some common information that we all stipulate to be true. When it comes to poverty, we've got a serious problem arguing rationally about it because we do not have a good definition that has been measured over time. The official poverty rate was constructed in a sort of an odd way. It was probably never intended to be something we would be using 50 years into the future. And it leaves out lots of things. Indeed, much of what the state, the county, the federal government spends to combat poverty never shows up in the poverty, st poverty statistics. It's based upon pre-tax income and only wage in or uh, cash income. So if you give families low-income housing, public housing, if you give them food stamps, 
In fact, even if you give them an earned income tax credit, which is a form of cash, does not show up in the income that is used to determine the poverty statistics. Now, this is an important point that both sides have missed and therefore have constructed some pretty bad arguments about. For example, I'm a conservative. Many conservatives who agree with me uh, during the past couple of weeks have written very uh, seemingly persuasive arguments that the war on poverty has been 50 years in the making, it's been extremely expensive, and the poverty rate has barely changed, therefore it's a disaster. It clearly didn't work, we need to try something else. But this assumes that the poverty line, as I've just described it, is a meaningful definition, which it is not. If, in fact, as the Brookings Institution scholars recently did, if you look at a more realistic analysis of what families are earning and receiving, both on the book's income and off the book's income, and take, in, take into consideration health care or daycare subsidies or earned income tax credit or food stamps or uh, energy assistance and so forth, you will see that the, the real poverty rate measured by consumption rather than by income has declined substantially since the mid-60s by 25 percentage points. It's really been a huge success. Now, does that mean that the war on poverty, as described by Lyndon Johnson and implemented in the various programs that were mentioned earlier, that that is responsible for all of the success? No, because if we also look before the 1960s, we saw a, at least as rapid decline in real poverty. So what's been going on over the decades is real improvement, and not just in America. The World Bank has a definition of poverty that is, we would consider it to be extreme poverty. Not very many Americans would fit it, but the World Bank's global definition of poverty is such that in 1980, as recently as 1980s, uh, large swaths of the population of East Asia and Southeast Asia, Latin America, South Asia, were impoverished, and today those numbers are much, much smaller. Uh, many scholars that study this subject on both sides of the aisle believe that since, the 19, since 1980, the globe has had the greatest reduction in poverty in the history of the human race. None of which is to say there aren't severe problems that remain. Obviously, we've been hearing about them. We all know about them. Uh, I'm informed by the, the, the story of my own mother, uh, who was born out of wedlock. Um, I never found out who my grandfather was until I was an adult and he had passed away. He lived across the road, but I didn't know he was my grandfather. She got out of poverty in the ways that people typically do, through education, through marriage before having children, through, yes, having a, at least one full-time worker in the household. If those three conditions are met, the likelihood of a family staying in poverty for very long is pretty low. If those conditions are not met, unfortunately, the likelihood of remaining in poverty for a significant amount of, amount of time is very high. So there are lots of important arguments that we can have, but first we have to have a clear definition of what we're measuring, measure it accurately so that we all agree, and then we can disagree, perhaps, about what to do about it. Thank you. Tom Henricks, I teach sociology here. I want to uh, bring forward two, uh, two perspectives, especially from my discipline. One is that uh, there are societal conditions that influence all our lives, and the second is that the social circumstances of people are intimately related. That is, uh, being poor is very related to being rich in America, just as male is related to being female, just as being a minority is related to a majority. Uh, I will begin. Uh, there are two great strands of the American commitment. The first is the commitment to individual liberty, understood as a kind of non-interference. We're allowed to go and do, create, achieve, and, and we're entitled to some of the blessings that come from that. All of us understand that stream well. But there is a second, more subtle stream, and that is we our commitment to the society that makes uh, our liberties possible. If you look at the Constitution, it's filled with we language. We the people 
in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, uh, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our prosperity, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, that does not mean just uh, us as individuals and our grandchildren. It means everyone's grandchildren. Uh, the U.S. is the great experiment in uh, democracy in a kind of community that is built from diversity. We are obligated to re recognize and support one another. And I will also add that most Americans have a profound sense of play fair play, uh, we, we admire equality of opportunity, but we know that the playing field is not even, and that is why we have some sense of the importance of equity. Now, I will say that uh, uh, people, uh, good people can have different viewpoints on how the social compact is formed, uh, but I think it is very dangerous when one extreme or the other of these two principles is accentuated. Uh, radical individualism is a kind of junkyard dog view of society where all we have to say to one another is stay off my property. But, but so also is a overly managed society which destroys uh, people's uh, uh, will to support themselves and their families. I think most uh, thoughtful people live between those two forms of extremism. Now, again, my uh, point today uh, well, I'll say a little more. I, I think we are saturated with the first theme I mentioned. We get it every day in our advertising, which encourages us to uh, pleasure ourselves. Uh, we get it from our uh, competitive business environment, which is about beating out other companies. The Super Bowl is coming up. Uh, we get it there. Uh, we celebrate winners. We forget about losers. Uh, we do not even think how those things are connected. Uh, we understand that theme well. Uh, Robert Billis says we've lost the language to talk about public commitment, and I think that's true. But I want to stress some uh, social, social themes. So here we go, and I'll do them rather quickly. Uh, they influence all of us, and they whipsaw the poor the hardest. Uh, first, uh, the, the change in the occupational culture. Uh, we live in a machine-based, technologized uh, uh, economy. Uh, machines have taken over. The gospel is that we will design, build, sell, fix, and operate these things. Those of us who do not will do information jobs or service jobs. Uh, that's the gospel, but I'm not sure that that's true. Uh, North Carolina labor force shrank 2.5% last year. Uh, the population rose 1%. Uh, that's not good news. Uh, the jobs are going away. Second point, globalization, uh, a very mixed record. At this current stage of history, too much of it is a search for cheap labor resources and less restrictive manufacturing conditions. Uh, our companies rely on to be competitive on cheap labor, but those same companies have trouble, those countries have trouble buying our goods. That is a problem. I'm from the Midwest to originally the Rust Belt. Those jobs have gone away. Our economic changes have created millions of jobs. A lot of them have been created in China. Uh, point three, a spiraling health care cost. Uh, this influences our lives more profoundly than we can say. Over two trillion uh, now, 16% of GDP, fastest sector, growing sector of the economy. Uh, what does that mean for us? So I will say neither party has the slightest handle on how to control those costs. Uh, it uh, affects our job structure. Companies now are moving to part-time or contract workers, and salaried people are made to work 60, 70 hours a week. After all, you only have to pay their benefits once. That's problematic for us. Again, where are the jobs going? Here's another one, change in the tax structure to support the wealthier uh, groups and corporations. Since 1980, top 20% now have 50% of the income, top 20%, 80% of the wealth, but that includes things like uh, land and houses and cars, stocks and bonds, uh, the top 1% control over a 50% of investment. And the effective corporate tax rate now is a lower than it's been since World War II. It is down to uh, 21%.
Couple more, change in the retirement system. There's an interesting one. We used to have older fixed benefit plans now derogated as legacy expenses. We used to have more union membership. That's dropped ever since 1955. What has happened? Well, people who have a little money now, and that's some of us, are worried about their investment, their individual retirement accounts. We're all hooked into the profitability of our corporate structures. We all worry about having enough, enough money. It changes our focus as a people. Last one, here's an unpleasant thing to say, uh, defense expenses. It's always the elephant in the room on every discussion about uh, public services. Over $700 billion spent last year, uh, 20 to 35 percent of our budget every year. We spend more than the next 13 countries combined. We spend nearly half the world's budget. We're 4.5 percent of the world's population. We are the world's police force. Uh, and often we feel we cannot uh, support uh, public service commitments because of that. I won't go through these others, but I'll mention them. Immigration, a million people a year. They're great, hardworking people, but we also have to be concerned about the jobs of the people who are our citizens and are not working. Uh, we have a political system that is dominated by corporations and interest groups. You can't run if you're not well-funded. We have a flight now from the concept of public education. Uh, I would never believe that that would happen. We have a failure of our media to sponsor ideas of the public good. We have radically increasing housing costs in America. All these things make it problematic for all of us to live. They are something that demands our attention. Uh, one of the speakers mentioned the uh, LBJ's war on poverty uh, 50 years ago. Now it feels a little more like we have a war on the poor. Now, I will be the first to say that my generation has done a poor job with these issues. We have fallen into ideological posturing. Uh, I will say the, young gener the younger generation has to put that aside. We need to craft practical solutions to these issues because we are not doing enough. Thank you to our invited panelists. And it occurs to me, as I think about all of these comments, that uh, the, the very people that we're talking about are, are lacking something very important uh, that I'm not sure we've wholly touched on, and that's power, relative power. And so I give a great deal of credit to our panelists for giving a voice to those who do not otherwise have a voice. So please join me one more time in thanking our community panelists and our invited panelists. And now we're going to move to the discussion format where we are taking your questions and we will continue to take those until we wrap things up at a little bit uh, Quarter past eight is when we'll wrap things up. But until that time, please continue to participate with Poll Everywhere and to write your questions down. And as I look at the questions we've received so far, many of them have a local flavor and lots of questions about what's happening in Alamance County. So I'm going to ask uh, some of those who are involved in local organizations, and maybe we'll begin with you, Nikki, uh, to give us your best view of the picture, the picture, and we have a lot of questions about actual statistics, but if you had to give a picture uh, in terms of numbers and maybe even uh, in more qualitative way, what does the situation look like in Alamance County? Well, last year's point in time count for um, all the homeless persons in Alamance County yielded um, less than 130 people, and so we know that that number is only the people that we could lay eyes on. Um, are there people who don't want to be counted? Absolutely. So we're not able to capture that picture. So, um, you know, that's the picture of the point in time count that happens every January of each year. 
As far as public housing is concerned, you know, we have 368 units. And there's a question on here that, um, you know, that asks how many people enter and exit uh, Burlington Housing Authority. And, you know, entrance is, is based on our vacancy rate. Um, and so in our admissions department last month, um, she told me she took 80 applications, but we don't have 80 apartments. So um, for those persons who can't afford to rent in the private market, let's say we only have five vacancies available, well, what happens to the other 75 families? They're forced to rent in substandard housing. Um, they may be forced to go and be um, shelter guests with Kim's agency. So these are our families who make decisions every day about where, where they will sleep, um, how to access services. If they don't have housing, then nine times out of 10, they're also struggling with employment because they don't have a place to call a residence. People can't call them back to follow up with, with, for job interviews. And so the, these are the families that we see on a regular basis. Heidi, Kim, or Phil, do you have any other raw data or statistics you think is relevant to share as it relates to a clear picture of the situation in Alamance County? That number doesn't include um, the homeless children who are counted through the school system, and, and those are hundreds of children. That's technically not included in the count because of the um, different variations of definitions of homelessness as far as HUD is concerned. And so that's another population that, again, needs to be addressed because these are families who are doubled up in our school systems, living with other families, don't, who may be living in motels or living in their cars, don't have a permanent residence. And for those who don't meet certain criteria, they're not eligible for certain housing programs. To run the story about the guys that I work with, and I can't give you any names, I won't give you any names. Uh, uh, the guys I work with, we say they're not homeless. That's because they're living with the girls that are already in public housing. Uh, and this always ends up bad, always. Uh, is either a, a abused woman that comes out the other end or there's more children we can't take out, take care of. But they don't have any other place to go. They may have been <coughs> time with Kim. They're not allowed to work, nobody will hire, so they can't afford to rent. They're gonna go somewhere so the downside is they're there. Are those counted out now? So but I think, should be. I think that you know it's at John's point, we don't have a good definition. And when we, when we have our point in time count in January, um, we can't count all of the kids that are um, couch surfing. Because that doesn't count for HUD's definition. HUD's definition is street shelter unfit for human habitation. Well, um, you know, Phil's guys, um, they don't count. Um, all of the kids that have been in and out of foster care, they, you know, they're still kids. They're not homeless. And you ask them, and they'll tell you, I'm not homeless. Because they're sleeping at someone's house. So we can't count them. So if we can't count them, then we can't get the federal government to look at Alamance County and say, wow, they can do some help financially. So it, it is a catch-22, and I find it ironic um, from a homeless shelter that we spend <coughs> every day of the year trying to reduce homelessness and then one day we got to go out and make sure it's really, really, really big. <laughs>
You know, there's things that we can do, there's things that we know that we can do today to help the people that um, need, to, need public housing or want to move out of public housing or want to get out of the shelter. There are things that we know we can do today and it will be reduced, but we got to do them. We, we got to, because otherwise this conversation is going to keep right on going. Okay, so to follow in that vein, let's take uh, this question. Are the resources in Alamance County adequate to change the current level of poverty to lower the rate? If not, what is missing? Toddy. Can I respond to that? Um, I think what I would want to say in regards to that question is I, I wouldn't, I'm not so obsessed with the rate because as we've said, the rate isn't really helpful because it's not necessarily accurate. But I think that we seem to have some consensus that there's deep concern about the issue of poverty in our community. And I think that one of the, the things that, I am heartened that there are so many community members who are here. And I think we have good evidence of other small communities who have decided that they wanted to address an issue like poverty in their community, who have worked together to develop a citizen's plan to engage in deliberative democracy. Um, we're beginning that process here, but to work together to talk about what are the problems with housing in our community? What's the problem of affordable housing? How many units do we have? What's the, what's the average rate and, and what's the average income? And, and how can we have, how can we uh, sort of, what are the processes that we could go through to maybe develop community land trusts? Or, I mean, there are all sorts of ways that communities go about addressing affordable housing. But, it's, it's only done when community citizens decide this is a problem and we don't want to stand it in our community anymore. The same goes for um, food and, and healthy choices about options for food. Um, and you know we can go through the list for education. It's in our hands. And I think that if we have the political will to make those changes, there is an enormous resource in this room right now. And I think the partnership of Elon University, I think there are a lot of faculty um, and staff and students who are eager to be partners in addressing these issues. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Well, I, I guess I'll pitch in. Uh, someone has to be the bad guy here. And uh, that is that we're living in a period of North Carolina's political history that is just very unusual. We're talking very hopefully here about, uh, you know, all the things we can do to address uh, unemployment, poverty, et cetera. Uh, this uh, cutting 5,200 teaching positions, uh, shifting 10 million to school vouchers, terminating unemployment uh, benefits for 170,000, that cutting the unemployment benefits back from, uh, what is it, uh, uh, 99 weeks to uh, 19 weeks, or the uh, worst state in the nation, depending on your view of things, uh, denying Medicare to uh, tremendous numbers of people, uh, abolishing the earned income tax credit. Uh, we reduced the uh, taxes for the top 5%. We, uh, by 2015, we're going to have a corporate income tax uh, rate brought down to 5%. I understand the philosophy. The philosophy is we are going to try to attract uh, corporations here. We're going to try to attack uh, high earning uh, people and uh, their, uh, their activities will trickle down to the rest of us. But I'm just uh, unsure that that's the case. It seems uh, like we're going in the wrong direction. I'm not a raging expert on these matters, but we have attracted all kinds of attention to ourselves as a showcase state, but I'm not sure we're showing ourselves to our best advantage. North Carolina has a, a proud and interesting tradition that mixes the fierce individualism with social justice, but I, I fear we've tipped it. So. Uh, uh, we can talk, but there are political changes afoot, and I, I'm not sure that they're addressing the issues that we are talking about. Nikki, do you want to finish up this kind of yeah. strand that we're on right now? Please. 
Um, I'd just like to say that, um, you know, the resources in Alamance County, you know, I'm grateful for my partners in the community and we do a good job at helping others. Uh, we must get past trying to help people make ends meet because um, making the meet isn't enough. You know, the ends must be connected so that they don't come apart anymore. Um, families need to be able to um, have income flow through their households such that they can establish a savings and not um, live from paycheck to paycheck. So making ends meet for our community isn't enough. Housing, yes, there are some affordable housing, but only affordable, affordable for those who make a certain amount of money. Not for those who have, let's say, lost their jobs um, from the, the, the death of the meal um, dynasty that, that, that was in our area. There was no replacement of jobs for those who had that skill set. So those persons are still struggling trying to find a place to fit in. They went, you know, maybe back to school to, to get reskilled or retraded in certain areas, but then found that they would have to go outside of the county to work. They're already struggling. How will they get to Guilford County or Orange County or to Raleigh to work those jobs, even though they may pay more? Um, fair market rent amounts. Again, we need cooperation with landlords who will reduce that rent amount to make it actually affordable to those persons in Alamance County. Thank you. We have several questions that have to do with the economics of poverty. So let's follow that uh, line of inquiry. And here's a question that says, how can we develop a model of economic interchange that values each person's hour of labor equally? Well, I, I, I better defend my role, my typical role as the bad guy, because you're taking it away from me. I need to be the bad guy, I feel left out. Um, you will never have an economic system in which everybody's hour of work is valued equally, because everybody's hour of work is not equally valuable. Um, I hate to break it to you, but it's obviously true. Everybody is equally valuable. Everybody as a human being has certain rights and responsibilities, demands on our hearts, demands on our pocketbooks. But in any given particular time, labor is something that you contribute in order to make a good or service that people are going to buy. And some people have, a at a particular point in time, are going to spend an hour and create a, a good or service that is worth $30 or $40, and someone else is going to spend an hour and make a good or service that is worth $10 or $15. You could pass a law that says everything is worth $40, but it isn't. Well, you can't pass a law to change reality. That's the, the, the only way you can evaluate the value of a good or service is what would someone expend in resources to acquire that good or service. So if we want to focus on the economics of fighting poverty, and we want to be empirical about it and look at the evidence, we would certainly agree, we would disagree maybe about what to do to encourage economic growth and job creation, but clearly that's part of the answer. It's part of the answer, uh, but it's not the entire answer. And even when I make the point, as I did earlier, that there's a correlation between uh, chronic poverty and something like marriage, uh, the correlation does not establish causality. Uh, there, the arrow points in both directions. On the one hand, it is much more difficult for single parents to bring up multiple children with all the demands that that requires as it might be for two parents. And so we might say, well, the failure to establish strong and stable families, strong and stable marriages before uh, begetting children is a cause of poverty. I think that's true. But it's also true that if you don't have lots of jobs that are available and people are not prepared through education and job training and soft skills to accept those jobs, particularly if men who are not prepared to do so are not very attractive marriage partners. So the poverty creates the, the breakdown of the marriage just as a breakdown of marriage can create poverty. So there's a very complicated set of relationships. But one of the solutions is to increase the rate of economic growth increase the rate of job creation. And as I said, if you want to look at reductions in poverty, whether it's in America or overseas, one of the causal factors is almost always robust economic growth. There are other issues too, but that's where we have to get to. Uh, I just wanted to uh, chip in about the, the level of pay differentials, however. Uh, I quite agree with Mr. Hood that uh, people are not going to be paid the same, but there is the issue of how great the differences should be 
if you look at uh, CEO pay at some of the big companies now, uh, 300 times as much as the, uh, the line workers make. Since 1990, CEO pay has risen 300%. Production workers' pay has uh, risen uh, 4%. Uh, the, the issue is not that people should be paid differently. It is how great those differences uh, should be. We would agree that we want our uh, creative, uh, powerful, educated people uh, making America great, but uh, uh, our working people, our regular people in America, they have been left behind in the last uh, uh, 20 years now. And uh, th that is something for us to uh, confront as a, as a people. Yes. And just in, um, in addition to Tom's point about the um, disparity in salary, I think that we also have to take into account <coughs> that equal pay for equal work. Women are still not paid the same as men for the same jobs, and nor are minority, um, minorities paid the same as well. So we can talk about um, the value of an hour's worth of work. But let's, let's level the playing field then. Um, a woman who is, has the exact same skill set, the same education as a man, should be paid the same. And, and we're not even there yet. And we have several questions that do tie into groups that are further marginalized, including women, and one on children. So I'd like to take a moment and, and talk about children. Uh, this question is, those children who are couch surfing and double up who don't consider themselves homeless should not be considered homeless. Rather, what can our community do to support and bolster kinship and community connections that keep those kids from being in the shelters? You know, children who um, aren't in foster care aren't afforded the aftercare options um, for those who age out of foster care. And so for those kids who have broken ties with families, um, you know, one of the things that we discuss in our um, monthly homelessness coalition is that there aren't any youth services for those children who have aged out or those children who don't have connections in the community so that they can establish themselves as adults in Alamance County. Um, the community can brainstorm, plan, and um, get in grant competition to start programming specifically for those youth. Scott, I'm looking at you in particular. Do you want to comment on what you believe uh, can be done to uh, build these relationships to keep these kids out of shelters? I think there's a reason people are quiet with that question. Um, that's a tough one. It's a really hard one. I think uh, more support services. Um, there is a kind of a, a gap for a lot of kids, in particular age ranges, um, where they are not being met. And um, if they're outside of any of those systems, they're kind of left floundering. Um, I think it gets complex to what Mr. Good talks about with job creation and a robust economy, because that supports stronger households, and stronger households are more likely to keep their kids. Poverty is kind of a, it lets everything spiral out of control. That's the best I can do. I, I don't know. I don't answer I, I used to be the executive director of a homeless center up in Duluth, Minnesota before I moved to Burlington. <laughs> the sad reality today is homeless teenagers are fleeing domestic abuse, sexual assault, sexual violence, <clears throat> and alcohol dependency issues, whether it's theirs or, their, or their, their families or both, mental health issues, whether it's theirs, their families or both. Um, and abuse, neglect, and exploitation are huge. Sometimes a shelter is a safe place for them. And I think that we also have to recognize that not every kid is gonna end up in a safe foster home like Scott can offer. Many of the kids that are out on the street today are fleeing um, abusive situations from foster homes. So I don't necessarily think that it's that we need to keep them out of the shelter. We need to look at our children and keep them safe, wherever that might be. And a safe place for our kids to go could be a shelter. 
And on a somewhat hopeful note there. Uh, so we'll wrap things up for this evening. And I would like to thank all of you for attending this evening. And please keep the dialogue going. Keep the discussion going. Please join us uh, next door here as we have snacks. And there were a lot of great questions. We didn't get to all of them. We will be, again, posting those online. And thank you again for coming. And we hope to see you next door. Have a good evening. Thank you.